Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome, everyone, to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. And I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. Thanks, as always, for joining us. This week's guests are undefeated IBF World Super Middleweight Champion Caleb Plant and unbeaten welterweight contender Jesus Ramos. Plus, a little later in the show, in our toe-to-toe segment, Mike and I will examine five fights where a heavy uh, heavyweight avenged a KO defeat. Of course, we do so with an eye on the third bout between Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder, set for October 9th on Fox Sports pay-per-view. But first, let's talk about the great Jake Paul, Mike. Uh, Paul, as you guys no doubt already know, won an eight-round split decision over UFC champ Tyron Woodley uh, Sunday night. And that's been the story on social media. Let's discuss the card itself, though. What were your overall thoughts? I thought the card was entertaining overall. Uh, the Montana Love uh, Ivan Baranchek fight was pretty wild. Uh, Daniel Dubois knockout was was brutal, although his opponent was hopelessly overmatched. It was brutal, uh, yeah. right? And I thought the Amanda Serrano Yamalith Mercado fight was fun to watch. So I thought Serrano looked terrific. Uh, the main event was was a different story, obviously. Yeah, I, I you know I I thought Montana Love looked great. That was a star making performance. As for Ivan Baranchik, I mean, he's taken a lot of punishment recently, and I think at the very least he needs to think about how many more fights um, he wants to have going forward. The, the fight I enjoyed most was Amanda Serrano versus Yamalith Mercado. Uh, some of the first fights I ever attended were Broadway boxing shows where Amanda Serrano fought and her sister, oh, uh, Cindy Serrano. And so, you know, to see how far she's come, uh, winning titles in seven divisions and getting a career high purse for this fight. I was I was just so elated for her. And you could see she was ready for the moment. She couldn't stop smiling during the ring walk. It just it really, really warmed my heart. And then, you know, she went out and showed you what a great fighter she was, you know. Um, but let's talk about the main event. Paul promised to turn Woodley into a meme, but I think uh, he got a little more than he bargained for in this fight. Well, this was the problem with the main event. If, if you got a spectacular knockout or a wild brawl, fans probably would have been satisfied. Uh, and that's probably what most people expected, however, uh, because that didn't happen. We were left with a fight between two. I'm being generous here by describing it this way. We were left with a fight between two raw, undeveloped boxers. Not only that, but neither guy was particularly active, which made it an even worse yeah. fight. Uh, I think it was sort of a disaster from an entertainment standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I I think that, it, you know, Woodley had more moments, it seemed to me, than than uh, Paul did. However, Paul did win the fight, but it, it, it wasn't that aesthetically pleasing, um, you know, and certainly paled in comparison to the to the other fights on the card. Where does Paul go from here? I think his reputation as a boxing entertainer, if you will, uh, took a hit on Sunday, a big hit. Uh, I mean, those who forked out 60 bucks to watch that fight uh, might hesitate to do it again after what they saw. You know, that said, I'm guessing he's popular enough to continue fighting guys like Woodley if he wants, uh, at least for a while. Uh, and I think enough people will buy into it that it, it'll be worthwhile. Uh, eventually, his, his appeal is going to decline, though. Uh, maybe he senses that already. He tweeted that he's retired. Right. Uh, I don't buy that for a second right now, but that, that's what he said. Yeah, I, I don't know how serious he is either. But if he is, then the sport has lost one of its biggest names. <laughs> right. um, but, Unfortunately, know, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the reality. Yeah. Um, and, and speaking of biggest names, I, I think that his next fight, he's got to go for the biggest name he can possibly get. I'm not sure how long he's going to want to continue doing this. I mean, he alluded to retirement. I don't think he's too serious. But it may be too risky to put him in with another fighter of Woodley's caliber or, or even slightly better. So I think they, they got to go for it all for you know whatever it's worth anyway let's move on to the next part of the show the pbc fight of the week this sunday september 5th fox pbc fight night returns with a triple header featuring three undefeated up-and-comers in the main event 
unbeaten rising welterweight sensation Jesus Ramos takes another step up in class and in weight as he faces 154-pound contender Brian Mendoza in a 10-round affair. Action begins on Fox and Fox Deports is at 8 p.m. Eastern time and we begin here with the essentials. Okay, here we go. Ramos, uh, 16-0 with 14 knockouts. Mendoza, 19-1 with 13 KOs. Obviously, Ramos is 5-0 in his last five with four KOs. Mendoza, 4-1 with three. Last fight for Ramos was his unanimous decision over Javier Molina on May 1st. Mendoza outpointed Thomas Lamana in August in his last fight. Uh, Ramos has one of the best knockout percentages, 88%. Mendoza, 65. Not too much experience for either guy, really, as, a pro- as professionals. Ramos, 45 rounds. Mendoza, 62. Mm-hmm. Ramos is only 20. Mendoza, 27. Uh, Ramos turned pro in 2018. Mendoza, 2014. Ramos is a southpaw. Mendoza fights from an orthodox stance. Uh, similar dimensions, they're both 5'10". Ramos has a 72-inch reach, uh, Mendoza 70. Ramos is from Casa Grande, Arizona, and Mendoza is from Albuquerque, but evidently he lives and trains in Las Vegas. Ah, okay, well, we've heard the essentials. We know what these guys are on, on paper, but of course, reality can be an entirely different story. Mike, what can you tell us about Brian Mendoza? I think he's a solid guy. He can box and obviously he has power. Uh, at the same time, I think he's vulnerable. Uh, that fight against uh, Thomas Lamana was a tough one for him. It was uh, it was a rough back and forth fight uh, in which he was hurt in the fourth round. Survived that though, uh, and and ended up having his hand raised in the end. But what what really stood out to me is that he can be hit, uh, which might not bode well against a guy like Ramos. Yeah, for sure. And nevertheless, it sounds like a very good test for Ramos. How do you like his progression thus far? I like it. Uh, He's coming off that decision over a crafty veteran in Javier Molina. Uh, I think he might have learned more in that fight than all of his other fights combined. Remember, he had never been past six rounds in any fight before that fight. That one went 10. Uh, We knew he could bang. He obviously could bang. Uh, I think he proved against Molina that he has the makeup to be a patient uh, boxer if he has to and just work out outwork the other guy which is pretty much what he did broke him down more or less just couldn't stop him uh, bottom line the guy just has a tremendous upside nothing's changed there style wise how do you see this fight playing out i don't think it's going to be like the molina fight at all uh as uh jesus said uh, Mendoza mixes it up, which is right in Ramos's wheelhouse. Uh, Mendoza has power. In theory, he could hurt Ramos, I guess, if he lands the right punch. Uh, I think that's unlikely, though. Uh, Mendoza's aggressive style is just perfect for Ramos. He's going to land punches. Uh, I think it's going to be a really fun fight to watch, like really fun, as long as it lasts. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be explosive. I'm assuming you're picking a knockout. Who you got? I think Ramos is going to get back to knocking people out in this fight. Uh, Mendoza's going to make it interesting for a while, I think. He might actually try to box for a while um, because of Ramos's power and because of you know, how things went against Lamana. But I think Ramos is going to draw him into exchanges, and that's going to be the beginning of the end for Mendoza. I'm going to say Ramos in uh, fifth-round knockout. Wow, that's, that's bold right there. I actually like Ramos by unanimous decision. I think Mendoza's going to uh, he's going to have to be a bit more careful. Um, I do expect him to get back to his KOAs in future fights, but these are the kind of bouts that teach you how to set up those finishing blows uh, because you aren't just going to walk through everyone. And Mendoza's big, Mendoza's big enough, I think, powerful enough, powerful enough to keep him on his toes and, and uh, you know, for him to remain standing after 10 rounds. But I guess we will see. Now, in the co-feature, undefeated lightweight contender Starling Castillo will face former title ch- challenger Juan Carlos Burgos in a 10-rounder, plus Unbeaten middleweight prospect Armando Resendez kicks off the broadcast against Marcos Hernandez in a 10-round fight. Quick update on the Prediction League standing. Still the same. Uh, Kenneth, myself, 24 wins, 4 losses, 3 draws. Mike, 21 wins, 7 losses, 3 draws. These numbers will change this week, but the standings will not. All right, it's time to bring in our first guest. We've been discussing him quite a bit, and now it's time he speak for himself. One of the rising stars of the game, the undefeated, Jesus Ramos Jr. Jesus, first, how has camp been so far for Sunday night? Uh, we've had a, a strong training camp. Um, I was originally scheduled to fight August 7th. So, you know, 
we we got an extra month to train and um I feel I feel more than ready for for this Sunday. Now you just fought in May, I believe. Did did you ever take a break from training or has it been nonstop? Uh I took a week off because I fought in February. I fought um the I fought the, the last week in February and I went straight into training camp for the May fight. Mm-hmm. And um after the May fight, that's when I I took I took my break. Oh. So, sounds good. Uh, Jesus, uh, assess your opponent, Brian Mendoza, for us. What are your thoughts on him, you know, strengths, weaknesses, et cetera? You know, he has a, he has a strong team behind him. Um, he trains with uh, Ismael Talas, so I know he's, he's surrounded by, uh, by great fighters, a lot of talent. Um, and he's, uh, he's a smart fighter. He likes to come forward. Um, applying smart pressure, but um, you know, I think, I think when, while he throws his punches, he kind of leaves himself open. I think his punches are too wide, um, and we're looking to capitalize on. It. Yeah, I was watching the. I went back and rewatched the fight with Lamana, and it seemed like that he he can be hit. Is that sort of that's so that's sort of your take too? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, I fought Javier Molina, who had a great movement, you know, and it was hard to hit him. I feel like uh, Brian Mendoza is a, is a whole different opponent. Um, it's going to be a lot easier to touch him. He's always going to be there. And uh, he, I don't think he has the same legs that Javier Molina had, you know, just moving and, and a lot of the lateral movement. Got it, got it. So I, I think you can still say this is a step up in class in terms of your opposition. Uh, and Mendoza is also a pretty big guy. Um, do you expect to, you know, stay on your toes, box a little bit more on this fight and be patient? Uh, you know, I, the be patient um, part, yeah, you know, I feel like um, I'm more mature as a, as a fighter now. I feel like I've grown a lot during this training camp and it's just my last fight. You know, I learned a lot, so I feel like I'm, I've implemented that into my training camps. And, uh, you know, so you can expect that, you know, more patient, more mature fighter out of me. But, um, you know, I don't think I'll be doing a lot of boxing. I don't think it's necessary against Brian Mendoza as long as I keep my my distance. And uh, I'm smart. You know, I don't think I have to be moving a lot with him. Now, you you brought up Javier Molina, who you fought last May, who's the most experienced fighter you'd been in the ring with uh, up until that point. You, uh, up until that point, you showed some real poise. You know, you box well to get the decision. How much did you learn from being in the ring with a veteran like Molina? Uh, you, you you honestly, I, I learned a lot. You know, honestly, I learned a lot. And um, just knowing that I can execute a game plan for ten rounds, you know, knowing that I can do that and stay focused in ten rounds, it was huge for me. Uh, you know, being able to kind of break him down round by round, it was just, it was, it was a learning process, you know, and during, during the fight, I felt like I did get overly anxious. I felt like I was looking for a knockout too much. And, uh, I, I learned from that, you know, I learned a lot and, uh, I think it's going to be different, different fighter, uh, it's a type of fit. You brought up looking for the knockout, and you had been knocking everyone out up until that point. Was it a bit frustrating for you that you weren't able to put him away? Uh, yeah, I did kind of get upset, you know, uh, that I wasn't able to put him away. It wasn't frustrating. I just, I was looking for it too much, I felt like, during the fight. And um, I think that's what that's what happened. I think that's the mistake that I made. Because, like you said, I was knocking everyone out. So, I felt like I had to do that. But, um, you know, in my previous fights, I wasn't really looking for a knockout. I was actually breaking my opponents down, you know. and um, But I don't know. It was the first, it was the first time in a long time with the fighting with the crowd and all of that, and I kind of wanted that knockout and wanted wanted to impress, and I let that get to me. Got it. Um, so you're still only 20 years old. You're you're not even old enough to drink, for crying out loud. Uh, yet you've uh, fought on a pay-per-view undercard already. Now you're headlining a Fox card. Uh, how far away are you from challenging the best in the division? Uh, hopefully not too far, man. You know, I keep taking these, uh, these fights, these tougher fights, for that same reason. Because I I want to be ready, you know. If the opportunity presents itself, I want to be ready to uh, to fight the, the the best in the in, in in the division, to fight the best out there. And I, I'm competitive, you know. So that's why I like fighting these type of fights. I like to I like I like my fights to be 50-50. I don't you know I don't like to have any advantages. So that's why I like taking these fights. Mm. 
Speaking of the best in the division, you've sparred with Terrence Crawford before. There are rumors that he may fight Sean Porter next. Who do you like in that fight? Uh, honestly, I think Sean Porter has a good chance. You know, he's um, he he's his style is just unpredictable. You know, and he's strong. And um, I don't think Terrence Crawford has has fought anybody as strong as him, or with that you know kind of uh, style that he likes to come forward and it's it, it's just unpredictable. So I think it's a, it's going to be a good fight. Um, Sean Porter has a good chance, but uh, Terrence Crawford is smart man. He's a smart fighter. Uh, he's always thinking in that ring, so it's it's going to be a good fight. And I don't know if you thought about this, but in your opinion, who are the top five welterweights in the world right now uh, in order? Uh, right now, uh, you know, I was spent to uh, Terrence Crawford, uh, Ugas, who just beat Manny Pacquiao. Um, you know, the f- number four, you know, I don't know if Pacquiao's still fighting, but if he is, you know, I, I would I would put him at number four. I think he, he deserves that. And uh, number five, my uncle Abel. He's, yeah. he's got to be up there, man. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Keep like it in the that. family. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, Jesus, you, you know, getting back to you, you come from a fighting family. Uh, you just mentioned uh, your uncle Abel. Outside of that family, though, who are some of the fighters you admired when you were growing up? Uh, growing up, I, I love to watch uh, Ricardo Sinito Lopez. Mm. Um just love his style, you know. I love I love his style in boxing, and I love how he carried himself outside of the ring. You know, he was extremely humble, um, from humble beginnings as well. And his, his story, you know, I, I, it's inspiring. And um, many of the things that you know he shared with with his fans are true. You know how people don't believe in you, but you know just little stuff like that that really stuck with me along the way. And um, you know, every time. I I hit something like that where, you know, someone tries to tell me something like they, they don't believe in me or that, you know, my dreams may not come true. You know, I, I always think about what he said and how nobody believed in him. And, and um, you know, it's just good to remember people like that, like Ricardo Siguiente Lopez. Yeah, he was he was a brilliant, brilliant boxer. We were just talking about him uh, a few weeks ago um, on this podcast. Now, you're five foot ten. I mean, you, you look big on TV, given how young you are, how long do you expect to stay at Walter Wade? Yeah, it's tough, man. You know, I mean, this fight is going to be uh, at uh, 154. You know, it was my, my last, um, well, this for this time, it was going to be a, a title limiter at 147. But, um, you know, some things happened, so the, the, the title limiter di- didn't go through. And uh, we decided to, t- to test the waters at 154 and see how I feel. I think it's a it's a more realistic weight. It's getting harder to make 147, and if I can get you know a title shot in 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 the near future, I don't feel like I can make it that much longer. You know, um, I'm just growing. Each training camp, I'm growing. I feel like uh, my body's changing, and um, just losing weight is tough, man. And and uh, you know, so we'll see we'll see how I feel Sunday night at this weight class. Yeah. Well, you you and Molina weighed around 150. I think you were a little less for that fight. Did it feel? Did you feel better weighing having those two extra pounds? Yeah, man, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it just yeah. I mean, every every little pound you know counts, and uh, I feel I feel really good. Very good. Lastly, uh, this is already your third fight in 2021. Do you like the busy schedule, and do you you do you plan to fight a fourth time this year? Yeah, you know, I like to stay busy. I like to stay in the gym. I stay in the gym regardless, you know, so I feel like if I have a fight, um, you know, it's, it's better for me. I'm always concentrated on something. I'm always looking forward to something. And um, But, yeah, after this fight, if everything was good, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, get another one, maybe November, um, early December, something like that, you know. I think it would be good to have a fourth fight and close the year off strong. Nice. Awesome. Jesus, we enjoy following you and your career. Uh, we know you're busy, so thanks for uh, taking the time to stop by. We hope to have you back soon. Thank you. Thank you, guys, man. I appreciate you guys for your time. Okay. Appreciate it. Take care, Jesus. Sunday on Fox. Oh, what a way to finish. The Rising Unbeaten Jesus Ramos Jr. takes on the super welterweight contender, Brian Mendoza. Oh, there's a shot. It's over! 
this Sunday at 8 Eastern on Fox and the Fox Sports app. All right, let's move on to our next guest this week. He is the undefeated IBF World Super Middleweight Champion. On Saturday, November 6th, he takes on Saul Canelo Alvarez for the undisputed 168-pound crown. Sweet hands, Caleb Plant. Caleb, Saturday, November 6th, one of the biggest fights of the year, if not the biggest. Has the magnitude of everything hit you yet? I mean... You know, I've understood even before this fight, you know, this is something that we've been working towards, something that I've been working towards. And um, so, you know, I've been um, plotting and thinking on this for a long time. So I'm not really too concerned about, uh, you know, the magnitude of things or how big this is. I'm focused on uh, what I control, and that's my training and um, my mentality and my mindset going into this fight. So Now, speaking of training, I know you're always in the gym, but I figured – you had already started camp when it looked like you and Canelo were going to fight on September 18th. Did you have to take a break at all, or has it been nonstop? Um, I mean, I'm in the gym year-round. You know, when we felt like it was going to go through, um, you know, I was picking it up, and then things kind of uh, crashed for a second, and so we slowed it down just a little bit, but I didn't really take a break. We just slowed up a little bit, and um, then we was able to get it figured, right, figured out, and so, you know, we're just taking it uh, – day by day so we can ensure that we um, reach the right spot at the right time. Caleb, was there ever serious doubt in your mind that you'd be fighting Canelo at all this year with how the fight fell apart at the 11th hour? I mean, again, we, we would have a deal and then he'd come back with more. We'd have a deal and he'd come back with more. So, you know, it's like, I, I don't know what, what his deal was. Um, but, he he knew. I think he found out that he, he we're not a team, and I'm not a fighter that he can just push around and, and bully. And um, you know, we was able to get it figured out. You know, I wasn't sure how it was going to go. I, I try not to get cu- too caught up in those things. It fell apart. What I can control is you know my effort and my attitude, which that's going to go towards training and making sure I'm staying in the gym and prepared for when an opportunity arises. So that's what I did. What was it like having to sit back and listen to people say you were purposely avoiding a Canelo fight when it was clear that you wanted it? Um, I mean, that, that doesn't really concern me. You know, people are going to say what they're going to say. I can't control what people say about me. And to be honest, what people say about me really ain't none of my business. What my mm-hmm. business is and making sure that I'm doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing. So, you know, a lot of those people, what have they accomplished? What have they done? What have they had? What are they going out and conquered? So, you know, that that's really the only emotions that I saw on that is, you know, what did they went out in life and conquered and, and, and overcame? So other than that, it's, it's none of my business what people say about me. Caleb, let, let's talk about Canelo's last fight, uh, eighth round TKO of Billy Joe Saunders. What did you make of his performance? I mean, he did what he had to do. Um, up until that moment, though, you know, I felt like Billy Joe was having a lot of success and doing a lot of good things. And, um, you know, but he got caught with a shot, and that can happen to anybody in boxing at any time. Um, that doesn't mean that he's unbeatable. He's been beat before, and um, honestly, he's looked beatable in a lot of his bigger fights. You know, he looked beatable against Lara. He got schooled by um, Floyd. He lost the first fight to Triple G, and it was a really close fight the second time. It was a really close fight with him and um, Kovalov as well. So, you know, him nor anyone else, any of his fans or anybody else in boxing, you know, they're not going to be able to convince me that the guy is beatable and that, um, you know, that this is some David and Goliath story. You know, that's not my mentality going into this fight. You know, you know, there, there are some people out there who have compared you to Saunders and thus they expect a, a similar result. I've heard you answer this question before, uh, so I'm going to ask again for those who haven't. Uh, can you tell us what separates Caleb Plant from Billy Joe Saunders? Well, I think there's a, a list of things. And, um you know, this is no knock on Billy Joe Saunders. These are things that he said himself, you know, even leading into the Canelo fight. You know, I haven't always been as disciplined as I should or do everything I should, but I'm here now. You know, those were his words. And it's like, you would never hear me say something like that because that's not, I'm always doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm always on my game. And, um, you know, just my discipline, my, my boxing ability, my boxing IQ, my mentality, my, my mental fortitude, everything. You know, when you do everything right for – 17 years you got so much riding on it that and so much confidence going into a fight that you know you 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 almost feel immortal you feel like you can't be beat but when you haven't been doing everything that you're supposed to been doing leading up to your big moment you know when the bell rings you're going to be thinking about those things and they're going to have an effect on you 
Caleb, you sort of just alluded to this, but without giving away too much of your game plan, obviously, uh, where do you believe you have advantages over Canelo? I mean, I feel like I have advantages in a lot of ways. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna speak on those things right now. If you guys want to figure it out or find out for yourself, you can tune in November six. But there's a lot of way, there's a lot of things that I hold over Canelo, um, and there's a lot of things that I possess over him that I can, you know, do better than he does. Okay. Do you do you take anything away from like the fights that you mentioned, Floyd and Lara, or do, do you feel Canelo is a different fighter at this point? I mean, he, he's uh, I think that he's made some adjustments, but I'm also not those fighters either. You know, those guys fight at 147 and 154. I'm a lot bigger than those guys naturally, a lot right. taller, a lot longer, mm -hmm. and um, you know, so there's a lot of things that uh, I possess over those guys that gave him trouble as well that um, he's going to find out about real soon. Do you think Canelo might be, a, uh, although a great fighter, do you think he might be a tad overrated? I mean, I don't know. I don't even get into that. I just know mm -hmm. that November 6th, and I'm going to get my hand raised, and it's going to be an easier fashion than people expect, and I'm going to become the first undisputed super middleweight of all time. So, how how important is that to you being being the undisputed super middleweight champ? Is it? I mean, folks are concentrating on the on you fighting Canelo Alvarez, and he's a star, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it it's a legacy fight for you, right? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, he's tried to toss out things before. You know, like what he did with Callum Smith. You know, it'll be five weeks. He'll know when he's going to fight, and no one else will know. And then five weeks before the fight, he'll be trying to make, you know a mega fight happened and that's only four weeks of training because the last week you're not doing too much. So it's like, you know, if you're the pound for pound best and you, you're so confident in your ability and your skills, why do you have to give other people, you know, half a camp to be the supposed pound for pound star, you know? So I don't know. I'm just excited. I'm just excited for the fight to get here. I'm, I'm ready to see people's faces when they, when they announce, um, <laughs> and the new and still undefeated. So, Another thing that I wanted to know is Canelo is someone you always had your eyes on uh, and were you studying or did it become more of a thing once a fight against him became a possibility? I mean, you know, there was a point in time where he wasn't really close to my weight division or, you know, I didn't feel like that we would be stepping into the ring together. But, uh, you know, I, I don't really think about every little step along the way. I think about my long-term goals and what I want to do overall in the sport. And then I, besides that, I focus on what's next in front of me. And I'm not trying to, I don't try to get too caught up in the details along the way, but you know, as his career progressed and as my career has progressed, you know, I felt like at some point that it would be me and him, him in there, you know, making this fight happen and, and, and doing it for the undisputed. And a minute ago, when you asked me, you know, what undisputed would mean to me, I mean, if you know me, if you know my story, then I mean, I, I've sacrificed everything for this and I've dedicated my whole life to this sport. And, you know, I'm somebody who wears that on my sleeve. And, you know, th th this moment means everything to me. It's my life's work coming down to one moment. And uh, I'm just, I'm going to seize it. I'm going to grab it. What, one thing that jumps out at me in an interview like this is how focused you are. Are you able to push everything, the extraneous stuff aside and focus on what you need to focus on? Is that just how you've always been? Yeah, I mean, I don't do anything else besides boxing. I don't. Yeah. I don't right. go to the club. I don't stay up late. I don't hang out. I, I go to the gym and I go home and I go to the gym and I go home. And, you know, maybe that ain't fly, fly enough for some people or cool enough for some people. But, I mean, my whole life <laughs> revolves around boxing. My wife is a boxing reporter. My father's a boxing coach. I mean, my, my mother, you know, my stepmom, you know what I'm saying? She, she loves boxing. That's all we talk about. That's all we think about. That's all we do. So, I mean, it's, it's easy for me because I don't really feel like doing anything else. You know what I'm saying? So it's not like I have to go out of my way to try and stay focused or try and be disciplined or try and work hard. Like this is something that's always come natural and easy for me since I, since I picked up this sport, this is how I felt about it. You know, this is as soon as I picked it up, that's all I wanted to be, you know? Yeah. You know, you, yeah. You, you know, you, you brought it up here, and and you said it a couple of weeks ago at the media scrum uh, during Pacquiao Ugas. You said, "Don't be surprised if this is easier uh, than y'all think." Can you elaborate on that a little bit? It, it sounds like you're expecting to dominate. Tune in November six, and I'll elaborate. <laughs> uh, 
you know, w- one other thing I want to uh, uh, mention is it seems as if no moment is, is too big for you. I mean, I, I remember when you, you fought for your first world title, you were underdog against uh, Jose Uskatsugi, and you you half danced, half strolled your way into the ring. Um, you weren't phased by by that tremendous crowd uh, in, in Nashville for your homecoming fight. Where does that poise come from? I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like that uh, maybe some of the events outside the ring or, you know, those things happen to me to prepare me for, you know, the rest of God's plan. Like, I honestly feel in my heart, like, this, this is my destiny that I'm about to fulfill. Like, this is literally God's plan for me to become undisputed. And why else would all these other things happen to me? So, you know, after a while, just dealing with certain things in the ring, or outside the ring, outside of boxing, you know, when you step into the ring, it's like, man, this isn't anything compared to some things that I've dealt with or gotten through or, you know, come out the other side of. And it's like, when you tackle those things and accomplish the, you know, the things that I have, those things are so tough and so hard that they literally strip you down to nothing. And then you got to rebuild yourself back up. And then you go through something else and it strips you down bare naked and you got to rebuild yourself back up. And when you come out the other side of so many things, like, you know, you almost feel unbeatable. Like nothing can beat you. Nothing can destroy you or stop you from obtaining what you're trying to get. And some of those things are so, sometimes boxing is so minuscule to those things that I've been through that when I step in the ring, it's like my sanctuary, you know, you know, we don't always get to control what happens in life and outside of the ring. But when that bell rings, you know, I do get to be in control of what's going on and what's happening. And I feel like that's, that's a big reason why I'm able to just, you know, stay poised and stay composed through through those bigger moments. You, you kind of led me to my next question. I mean, you, you had a pretty uh, rough backstory from from being homeless at, at at points to what 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 happened to your daughter Leah and, and, and with your mother as well. I mean, so much. Uh, you 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 persevered, and now in a span of a couple of years, you're 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 reaping the uh, benefits. Uh, you went from being an underdog against Jose Uzgatsky to winning the title, and now you're fighting the biggest name in the sport for the uh, undisputed crown. Do you ever reflect on how far you've come? At times, at times, you know, that's something that I'm not super good at. You know, I tackle one thing, and then I'm just ready to, what's next? And I go right back to the gym, and I get right back to work, and I'm ready to accomplish whatever the next goal is. But, you know, here and there, you know, I think back about, you know, just how far I've come, and, you know, the house that I'm in compared to the house I grew up in, or the car that I drive now compared to the car that my first car, or, you know, what I eat now compared to how scarce, you know, eating was when I was a kid or whatever the situation may be. And, you know, I, again, it makes me proud of myself. And, you know, eventually, you, like I said, you come out of so many things and come out the other side. It's like, man, what? <laughs> there's literally nothing on God's green earth that can stop me. Caleb, your numbers on Fox and on FS1 when you fought Uzkatagi were were really good. They were insane. Uh, you've already you're already one of the biggest names in the sport, but in facing Canelo, you're now introducing yourself to another group of fans who may not be as familiar with your work. What do you want those fans to know about Caleb Plant before the bell rings? That you know, you guys may not know about me yet, so I'm sure that you people are underestimating me. You know, nowadays there's a lot of casual fans, people who don't follow the sport, but they may know the biggest names, and that's the only point of view that they're looking from. But I'm just encouraging you and letting you know that you need to turn in, tune in November 6th because I can assure you I'm nobody to play with. And if he feels like he's got an easy fight on his hands, I can assure you that he's got another thing coming. And if you don't want to believe me, if you don't want to take my word for it, then please, please, please just tune in. November 6th, because mm. there's going to be a new sheriff in town. I love it. Uh, Caleb, last last thing. Uh, you know, obviously, you're focused on uh, what stand, what's in front of you. Uh, but if you could look ahead just, just briefly, like a few years down the line, maybe when it's time to walk away, uh, what do you see as the legacy of Caleb Plant when all is said and done? I mean, by the, said, this is, by the time this is all said and done, you know, I'll be in Canelo Alvarez, and if he wants, if, if there's a rematch that has to be done, I'll beat him twice. I'll beat David Benavidez, I'll beat Charlo, and I'll be crowned as one of the greatest fighters of this era, period. And um, I'm doing everything in my power from now till then, literally every day, to make sure that I can accomplish that and do that. And those are the, the goals that I've had my eyes set on, 
and um, I don't plan on letting anybody or anything in the way of that. So. Fantastic. Caleb, we know that you're one of the busiest guys in boxing, especially at the moment, so we really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to do this interview. Yes, appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. Take care. Thanks, Caleb. All right, y'all. Peace. Peace. Sunday on Fox. Oh, what a way to finish. The Rising unbeaten Jesus Ramos Jr. takes on the super welterweight contender, Brian Mendoza. Oh, oh there's a shot. It's over. Sunday at 8 Eastern on Fox and the Fox Sports app. It's time for Mike and I to go toe to toe. As you all know, on Saturday, October 9th, WBC heavyweight champion Tyson Fury will take on Deontay Wilder live on Fox Sports pay-per-view. The two fought to a draw in December 2018, and then Fury stopped Wilder in their rematch in February 2020. Now they meet again. Fury, of course, is the favorite, especially coming off a KO win, but fighters have bounced back from such losses before, so... On this toe-to-toe, we're going to look at five heavyweight bouts where a fighter avenged a KO defeat. Mike, we're going to start with an epic rematch that took place at a sold-out Yankee Stadium on June 22nd, 1938. Joe Lewis versus Max Schmeling. Okay, here's the background. Schmeling, the German heavyweight, and the then unbeaten Lewis met for the first time in 1936. Schmeling had said beforehand repeatedly that he saw a weakness in Lewis that he planned to exploit. Well, that turned out to be the fact that Lewis dropped his left hand after throwing his jab, and Schmeling did, in fact, exploit it with uh, powerful right hands. He put Lewis down in the fourth round, uh, the first knockdown of his career, by the way, and he finished him off in round 12. Now, fast forward to 1937. Lewis won the heavyweight title by stopping Jim Braddock in eight rounds, which was the start of one of the most storied championship runs in boxing history, as I think most people know. However, Lewis said openly that he wouldn't feel like the true champion until he avenged his loss to Schmeling. Now, fast forward one more time to June 1938 at Yankee Stadium, as you mentioned. Uh, First, this wasn't a boxing match. It was arguably the most important boxing match in history because it came during the rise of the Nazi party in Germany. Lewis came to represent good and schmelling evil to most of the world. Uh, (laughs) So this so this was as much a political event as it was a sporting event. In the end, Lewis avenged the earlier loss, delivering one of the most brutal knockouts that you'll ever, ever see. Uh, Lewis, perhaps is determined as any fighter in history, needed only two minutes and four seconds to just destroy Schmeling and become the heavyweight king in his mind. Uh, That was just one of the all-time legendary performances. Yeah, no doubt an incredible win. And, you know, Lewis prepared a lot more seriously for that rematch than he did the the first fight from what i read you know no booze uh no women whereas i think he he partied pretty hard in 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 the build-up to the first fight uh you know one thing it's it's great to see that they became friends you know later on in in life and um you mentioned that schmeling was perceived as the bad guy even though he was at odds with the nazi party um you know, for for much of his life. In fact, I I read that he he housed two Jewish kids uh, after Kristallnacht, um, which I thought was just uh, amazing. But you know, getting back to to Lewis, I don't think you can understate what the victory meant for the African American community. I mean, the first loss was sort of like a loss to them all, and the rematch was was a win for the advancement of their fight for civil rights. You know, even though I think newspapers at the time had. Lots of nasty comments about Joe Lewis and, and so forth. But, you know, God bless him. He was a true national hero. Yeah, I think I think national hero is a good way of putting it, because um, I think that he might have been the first African-American athlete who uh, white people actually rooted for. Uh, not all of them. <laughs> not all of them, obviously. But my mother, t- my, my uh, grandfather was a, a big boxing fan. My mother told me that he absolutely idolized Joe Lewis. Wow. So there was there was a lot of people out there like that. He was uh, he was just enormous. And you mentioned something else that's really interesting. It's sort of a common theme with all these guys. They all got serious for the rematch right. um, <laughs> because they knew they knew they screwed up and they wanted to rectify it. So all all and all of these fights that we're going to mention, the guys got really serious in training for the second one. Yeah, I think it's easy to say, oh, they you know they get up for every single fight, but that's just not the case. It's almost impossible right. uh, to 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 maintain that for every single fight. So uh, especially you know in that time where they fought a lot more than they do now. Right. Uh, but let's uh, let's move on to the next bout on our list. Another 
epic return bout, June 20th, 1960. Uh, Meet Me Uptown by the Polo Grounds. By the way, only New York hip-hop fans will understand that reference. But the fight did take place at the Polo Grounds. Uh, and I'm talking about Ingemar Johansson versus Floyd Patterson, part two. Mike, what went down? So Patterson had the dubious distinct distinction of being a yo-yo in his heavyweight title defense against Johansson in June 1959. Patterson went down seven times, yes, seven times in the third round and didn't make it out of that round, thus losing his title in an embarrassing way. Uh, he fell victim to the Hammer of Thor, which was uh, the name for Johansson's right hand. Uh, Patterson, if you recall, was the gold medal winner at middleweight in the 1956 Olympics. He was a small heavyweight, but I don't think anybody imagined that they would see anything like that against a guy like Johansson. Uh, anyway, a year later at the Polo Grounds, as you mentioned, uh, Patterson set things right in a big way. He was as focused as he'd ever been and came in both heavier and stronger than he was in the first fight. I think he was like nine pounds heavier. And he just dominated the rematch, putting Johansson down with a left hook in the fifth round and then finishing off, finishing him off with another hook, uh, which knocked him unconscious. That's the fight in which Johansson's left foot can be seen twitching as referee Arthur Mercanti counted him out. Uh, sort of just a, a legendary moment. Uh, and for the record, Patterson would survive two first-round knockdowns in a third fight to stop Johansson in six rounds in 1961. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like these fights, th this trilogy is an example of, you know, you know, saying all it takes is one punch. Well, that's especially true in the heavyweight division. I don't know if Patterson had the strongest of chins, but he must have been incredibly resilient. I mean, they had three fights, and, and Johansson dropped him a total of nine times. You know, in those three bouts, yeah, Patterson won um, – two of the three. So uh, sp speaks well of him. Uh, my understanding is that Johansson didn't have the best training habits either. I don't know if you heard about that, but apparently he, you know, he oh, lived a, a certain playboy. lifestyle. Oh, yeah, was he? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I thought it was just, yeah, I just thought he had a bad camp. <laughs> no, no, he's a, he was a good looking guy and he was like this big, big, big personality in Europe. Now he was a big, he was a big thing. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, yeah. The thing about Patterson was, is that he was just tiny. Um, Yes, he could never have stood up to, to Sonny Liston, who was a legitimate heavyweight. I, I always wondered, wondered how Patterson would have done like as a cruiserweight. He might have been the greatest cruiserweight of all time. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder what a lot of these guys would have, would have been like at cruiserweight today, you know, where, where the limit is 200 pounds. Um, anyway, we've got to move on and we'll go into the next one, which is uh, we've combined two rematches on our list for our next choice. Lennox Lewis versus Hasim Rahman and Lennox Lewis versus Oliver McCall. Floor is yours. So Rahman and McCall demonstrated that Lewis could be taken out with a single punch. McCall in two rounds in 1994 and Rahman in five rounds in 2001. Uh, Rockman's upset was particularly big because Lewis was the more was more established at that point. He had already had fights with Evander Holyfield, uh, and was just the unquestioned star of the division, one of the biggest stars in the sport. Uh, conventional wisdom is that Lewis lost focus for that fight. For example, he trained in Vegas so he could make a cameo appearance in the film Ocean's Eleven. Oh, that's, that's that's sort of a classic misstep, I think, in some people's minds. Uh, he showed up in South Africa for the fight later than he intended. Uh, and in the end, Rockman, who was a 20 to 1 underdog, scored one of the biggest upsets of the era. He backed Lewis into the ropes. Lewis dropped his hands for a moment, and a huge right took him out. Well, as we know, Lewis avenged both of those setbacks. Uh, the rematch with McCall was one of the most bizarre fights in the history of the sport. McCall just kind of stopped trying during the fight. Yeah. Uh, he just was like walking around and doing nothing as the spectators booed. Uh, it was just like he, he had just snapped at, at, at some moment in the fight. And then after the fight was stopped in round five, McCall started crying in the ring. So uh, it was a very, very strange moment. And um, he almost had to feel bad for McCall. Who knows what was going on there? Uh, yeah. So that's how Lewis regained that title. Uh, the Rockman fight was more conventional. Lewis was uh, just absolutely on a mission in that fight. He picked Rockman apart and then knocked him flat on his back and out with just a huge right hand. Rockman got up and then just fell right back down again. There's no way he could have continued. Uh, I'll never forget Lewis just pounding his chest. I mean, he was pumped, absolutely pumped, pounding his chest, chest as if to say, I got back what's mine, and indeed he did.
Yeah, I, I remember a lot of folks were picking against him um, in in the rematch against Rockman, and, and you're right, he absolutely wasn't focused um, for that fight, which I believe was in South Africa. You mentioned, I mean, you know, the um, I don't think he showed up until like the week of the fight, whereas Rockman had been training in South Africa for right. the past month. It was, you know, and uh, although you know that that first fight, it was it was fairly even. Um, up until Rockman landed that that big right hand that, that put Lewis down on his back, but you know what a change of fortunes in, in the rematch. I actually remember the build up; uh, they brawled at like on ESPN or something during a, a, a live show, and then um, on fight night while Lewis was taking a nap, Rockman went over to Lewis's uh, locker room and tried knocking on the door to see what he was doing, which was kind of weird, but maybe in retrospect. Uh, a sign of fear or or concern, and and he should have been because Lewis came out there and he boxed beautifully for three rounds, and then he absolutely obliter- obl- obliterated him. That was a phenomenal performance. That that the McCall rematch, I don't know what to make of that. Um, he was going through some stuff. That yeah, was he just- sure was. He should have been in the ring that night. You know, that was that was just crazy. All right, let's let's go on to the next one on our list. July seventh, two thousand seven. Vladimir Klitschko rematching Lehman Brewster in Cologne, Germany. Okay, to refresh everyone's memory, Klitschko had a bizarre period early in his career, uh, if you want to call it a period. It was between 1998 and 2004 when he was stopped three times. Uh, Ross Purity was the first, then Corey Sanders, and then Lehman, uh, Lehman Brewster. Uh, Klitschko's chin was questioned, his fitness was questioned, his toughness was questioned. It was just kind of bizarre, and nobody could really make heads or tails on exactly what kind of problems he was having. I don't I don't think it was just his chin. I think it went beyond that. Uh, well, as we know, he rebounded from those setbacks. They have a decade-long dominating run as heavyweight champion. He just dominated an era. Uh, he never had a chance to avenge the losses against Purity and Sanders, but he did get a second shot at Brewster, uh, who had stopped Klitschko after five rounds to win the W. B.O. title in their first fight. In the rematch, the new version uh, of Klitschko just pummeled Brewster until his trainer, who was Buddy McGirt, stopped the fight to save him from further punishment. Uh, I'm I'm guessing that Klitschko would have liked a more dramatic stoppage um, to really sort of like put a punctuation point on the fact that he was able to avenge the loss. At the same time, I'm sure he appreciated the chance to at least avenge one of those uh, weird setbacks early in his career. Yeah, it was, and 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 Lema Russo was was a very very good fighter. I remember how he bombed out uh, uh, Andrew Galata. Quick hands, uh, you know, power in both fists. He was he was just a tough tough tube, pretty big um, uh, size wise in terms of at least for that era. However, I think he was well past his best when uh, when when uh, Klitschko got him in the ring again in in 2007, and it showed in that fight. He just, I mean, he wasn't there the same way Klitschko wasn't there in the. Uh, in, in the first fight. Nevertheless, uh, Vladimir got his revenge. And, um, you know, to me, his his heavyweight run is so underrated. I mean, a decade of, of dominance where he controlled guys single-handedly. And when I say single-handedly, I mean literally single-handedly with his left jab. I mean, he controlled opponents for 10 years with that one shot. And he had a monstrous uh, uh, right hand as well. Great ring IQ. I mean, you name it. Vladimir Klitschko to me, one of the more underrated fighters Um of recent times. All right, let's go to our last fight on the list, most recent, December 7th, 2019. Anthony Joshua versus Andy Ruiz, the sequel, Indiria, Saudi Arabia. Okay, talk about weird, stunning results uh in heavyweight in a heavyweight <laughs> fight. Um, I don't think very many people gave Andy Ruiz much of a chance against Anthony Joshua, who obviously was rolling uh, toward becoming like, you know, the man in the division. Uh, well, he got he got hit. Um, I keep I keep seeing in my mind that shot that landed on his temple uh, and uh, he ended up going down however many times he went down in that fight. Uh, but and it wasn't it wasn't just that. I think he was hurt, but I think he was also confused. He didn't know. He really didn't know how to respond. He just had no idea how to cope with what was happening in the ring. So I think it was a combination of uh, physical problems and uh, mental problems. And I don't mean mental problems like he's crazy. It's just like, I don't know what to do. Uh, And he just sort of kind of gave up, Uh, which is one of the stranger things that I've seen in the heavyweight championship fight. Very, very strange fight. And it was an amazing, from, from Ruiz's standpoint, it was amazing to watch that. It was just, you saw how happy he was after the fight. And it was, it was so stunning. Uh, so dramatic, uh, so amazing for him. 
Uh, and it sort of uh, it sort of led to his his demise, at least as as it applies to the rematch with uh, with Joshua, yeah. because in the in the rematch, Reese came in. I mean, he's already heavy, but he came in a lot heavier than in the first fight. He obviously wasn't fully prepared for the rematch. Uh, and Joshua, the, the difference between this fight and the other four that we mentioned is Joshua wasn't interested in knocking out Ruiz. All those other guys wanted to knock out their the guys who knocked them out. Uh, uh, Joshua just wanted to win the fight, and that's what he did. He just used his boxing skills. skills. He moved, he outboxed Ruiz, and he, and he won a clear decision. So he won the fight, but he didn't get the knockout, which I thought was an interesting aspect of this fight. Yeah, for sure. You know, going back to the first fight, I remember watching Ruiz versus Alexander Dimitrico uh, a couple months before the Joshua fight, and he landed a right hand. Dimitrico was about six six, six foot seven. He landed a right hand on Dimitrico, and I thought, holy crap, the way he did it. When they announced the Joshua fight, I just had this nagging feeling That's interesting. That, that Ruiz was going to knock him out. And I couldn't bring myself, I, I know it sounds like, you know, excuses. I just couldn't bring myself to pick him. But I just had a nagging feeling that he was going to knock him out based off what he did against the Mentrico. You got to watch that fight. It was very impressive. And um, sure enough, he, yeah. he uh, well, you know, uh, again, I'm, I, I mean, I know you have. I, but, you know, he did exactly what he did in that fight. I mean, the jab, the combinations, the fast hands, and the right hand. And, um, you know, repeatedly found a home for it, although it was the left, the left hook that uh, initially got Joshua in trouble. I think it was a brilliant performance, and I feel like if he had showed up in that kind of shape, and perhaps he was only in that kind of shape because he had, uh, it was just two months between the Dimitrico fight and, and the Joshua fight, and he never really left the gym. Um, but if he had showed up in that kind of shape against Joshua in the rematch, Joshua, I thought, was very timid. Uh, in the rematch, yeah, he was. Yeah. Um, perhaps he would he would have gotten the same kind of result, or at least taken him, you know, reminded of what happened in that first fight and taken him deep, deep, and we would have seen what uh, uh, into deep waters. And we would have seen what Joshua would have been able to do. But Joshua, to his credit, he slimmed down in weight. He came in with a different plan. He wasn't trying to bomb Ruiz out this time. He decided to box and move, and he did that impressively. And I I think he showed a a different dimension. And I also think that you know. For heavyweights, no loss in get in there's you know in getting knocked out or, or knocked down it happens. These guys are, are big guys, but um, I think it allows you to take punches better in the future and know how to handle yourself. I mean, Lennox Lewis was decked repeatedly by Vitali Klitschko um, in their fight, and he handled it a lot better than he did uh, against Oliver McCall and, and Hasim Rahman, two guys who I'm not convinced hit as hard as uh, Vitali uh, Klitschko. So who knows how. Uh, the uh, the Reese fight would make uh, Joshua a, a better fighter. And I think, you know, getting back to what we were mentioned at the beginning, a lot of people don't think Deontay Wilder can beat Tyson Fury in their third uh, encounter, but there's historical evidence that shows that he can. So I wouldn't be surprised to see anything happen on, on October 9th. No, you're ab- you're absolutely right. I think the, 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 I don't know if this is the right term for this, what we're talking about, but the knee-jerk reaction the jerk thought is that he, he can't beat fury after what happened in the second fight well if you watched uh, the schmelling lewis fight the first fight you think well there's no way that lewis is going to beat this guy after what happened in the first fight yeah. so you just never know when, and when a guy has that kind of power and he's a good athlete don't forget that um yeah, yeah. I, I think we could be i don't know who's going to win the fight necessarily i don't know if he will but i think that people might be surprised that the same thing the exact same thing won't happen again Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, too. I can't wait for October 9th. And with that, it's going to do it for this week's episode. We want to thank Caleb Plant, Jesus Ramos for joining us. You can catch Ramos this Sunday, September 5th, as he takes on Brian Mendoza in the headlining event of Fox PBC Fight Night. Action on Fox and Fox Deportes begins at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you all for tuning in and be sure to check back with us next week for more boxing banter right here on the PBC podcast.